Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Martin Keynes Literary Festival and to our online programme. Tonight is our 53rd online event. Previously, we brought you poets, novelists, flash fiction writers, workshops, songwriters, members of parliament and scientists. Tonight, we bring you something rather different and very special. We're joined by Anna Shevchenko, a British-Ukrainian writer and journalist who's collected people's personal stories of how life goes on during times of conflict. Proceeds from the sale of the resulting book are being donated to Ukrainian charitable project, projects as are the profits of tonight's event. So thank you all for buying tickets and thereby donating. Thank you. I'll post details of how to buy the book in the chat during the event with details of Anna's Just Giving page. Please feel free to share these links with anyone who you think may wish to contribute. Likewise, if you have questions for Anna, please post them in the chat and we'll take as many as we can at the end of the event. We're recording tonight's event, so please stay muted until the Q&A section. Uh, you will find that uh, you will be allowed to unmute yourself at that point. Uh, if you wish to turn off your camera, that's absolutely fine. Your cameras were off by default on arrival, but you can turn them on if you wish. And now, before I hand over to Anna and to Flora Reese, who will be in conversation with her tonight, let me share with you part of a WhatsApp message that we received from Anna during a recent visit to Kiev which may give you just a taste of flavour of her remarkable book and of some of the lives that it documents so moving them. And here is a taster of my life in Kiev with two hours electricity at night. Shower with candles has never been so romantic. Do all my work in these two, two hours, and a lot. And crucially, who needs the alarm clock if you have the air raid siren to wake you up? P.S. The streets that are lit are beautiful. At which point, let me hand over to Anna and to Flora. Thank you, Dave. And hello, everyone. And welcome, as Dave said, to this very special evening with Anna Shevchenko. With so much happening on the global stage that ongoing events so easily get lost in the daily onslaught of news. When Milton Keynes Litfest had this opportunity to talk to Anna about her new book from Ukraine, Around the War in 20 Stories, we felt that these were tales that need to be heard and this is a cause to be supported. So Anna is a British Ukrainian writer and journalist and deeply experienced in cross-cultural communication. And I've personally been privileged to work with her over the last decade, editing her novels. Anna's previous two books, The Quest and The Game, are thrillers featuring fictional events in and around Ukraine. But now circumstances have brought her to give us the truest of stories gathered from the people who've been living through war and loss, exile and daily peril since February, 2022. But despite everything, I think it's important to recognise these are, to quote the subtitle of the book, Tales of Hope, Humanity and Humour. Anna, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. So you've actually recently returned from Kiev. Can you tell us something of what it's like there? Um, it's a very fragile world. Uh, fragile because you're going through the streets which are lit, which are happy one minute and then you go out, go down to another street where you can see the flags for everybody who died you can see the, the military funeral with all the honors so everything is or i wouldn't say an illusion but sort of an illusion because everybody looks fine dressed fine their cafes are open sun is shining but behind this i know that everybody has either lost somebody or, you know, is trying to, to pretend that they're okay. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of black humor. I had a lunch with a friend, and I think you'll show this uh, alert on the phone later. And um, what's happening with that is that suddenly the air alert, air raid alert, appears on your phone. And she says to me, oh, don't worry, I've got a more sophisticated alert. I can see what is flying. Now it's just a drone, so we don't have to be worried. Let's carry on with breakfast and have our coffees. Then she looks into the uh, on the app again and says, well, this time it's something more serious. We'd better take shelter. Let me share some photos that you gave us um, from your visit recently, which will include that picture you mentioned. Okay. So here, I, th I think this is the, the peace and the quiet and how it looks calm from a picture. Yeah, so this is one of the main squares, and it's the cathedral, the 18th century cathedral. So it looks fine when it's lit, but the electricity can disappear any minute. 
but you can see how peaceful and quiet it is and uh you know you don't expect you don't even realize that in uh, 10 minutes later there could be an air raid and this is an alert that everybody gets on the phone and i have it on my phone all the time because i've got family and friends there so i have the alerts you can see yeah. all the time on my phone even as we speak the alerts come up and that's one of the things that's so hard is being separated from people there knowing what's happening Exactly. And uh, this, for example, is a part of black humour, because if you look carefully, I bet you won't know what it is, because uh, you will remember what it is if you watch the films of the Second World War. They are the anti-tank boulders that stop the, 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 the cakes, rather, in the shape of anti-tank boulders that stop tanks from moving. And that these cakes are made in a very fancy patisserie. And if you buy this cake, all the money goes to support the military. So everything has this incredibly strange cycle of war, even when you have a sweet cake in the patisserie. Just an extraordinary way of dealing with what is happening on a daily basis. And of course, this ties back into the book where you are really revealing what it's like, what is happening out there. Tell us about this this little video, which I'll just play. Well, this is the video I took in the main square. And I think if you show the video, you'll see all the flags. And these flags, every single flag is a life, lost life. And every city, big city in Ukraine, has a similar um, square with the lost lives and flags. And if you look, you can see the whole sea of flags. And I think that's when you realize how many people gave their lives defending the country. It really does bring things home. I think uh, alongside pictures like this. Well, this is an everyday uh, life in Ukraine because it looks very cartoony, but what actually it is, it's on the main street and you walk up and instead of the advertisement of, I don't know, cars or something like that, you have got an advert which says, explain to the children how to deal with the mines. And that's an everyday occurrence on the main square, on the main street, just outside the supermarket. This is a type of um, advertising you can see. There are lots of uh, lessons at school about the mines because many mines, when um, Russians occupied uh, um, the area outside Kiev, were hidden in the toys were hidden in the woods, in the cans. There was one story where they stayed in a flat and uh, the mine was hidden in the piano. They saw that a little girl in the family was playing the piano, so they hid the mine there so that as she opens the piano, it would have blown her fingers off. But a father realised that something was wrong because he saw that the photograph of his daughter on the piano moved and he found the mine first. That's a really powerful story. Yeah. Um, there was one more photo that you wanted to show us for your recent trip. Yeah, this is um, for me uh, one of the most powerful moments of the trip because uh, this is just outside Irpin and Bucha, the places which are known all over the world for the massacres where lots of female families, civilians were killed by the occupying forces. And these cars are not just burnt cars, you know, uh, on, uh, on the side of the road. Every single car had a family escaping with children, women, and uh, fathers driving. Every single car had a family killed. And that's why it's so powerful, because this is remaining now as a memorial to all those people who tried to escape and were killed on the road. I think one of the things that um, is also incredibly powerful about this is it's a picture that until you hear the story behind it, you don't necessarily understand what has happened if you're coming from outside Ukraine um, and seeing a picture like this. And so it really brings home, I think, one of the really crucial things that you're doing with the book of Around the War. Because although we say a picture paints a thousand words, sometimes you actually need the words behind it to make that story come to life. Um, I think this is such a powerful read. Um, the range of voices from old to young and from all walks of life who've experienced the war in so many different ways. Um, and 
Was it this that sparked you to want to write and share stories rather than just listen to them? Because there's so much power behind the words. Uh, well, you know, I started collecting those stories from day one. And I think we are today going to hear the story from the first day of the war. Um, and I was uh, writing them like, you know, like an archivist or somebody who wants to, to people to, for people to remember. But then I realized that voices were so powerful, voices of ordinary people, they have to be heard, not just the voices about hero, hero, heroic deeds, about courage in the front, about the tragedy, but also voices of people who carry on regardless, for him, for whom the war becomes a way of life. And I think that was quite a, um, you know, quite a difficult thing for me because when I was listening to their emotions, I everybody said to me, you must have been, had a, this as a therapy. But I said, no, it wasn't a therapy because I had to close my emotions. I had to make sure that their voices, their emotions are heard. And that was quite difficult. And the most difficult thing was to give the stories to them to read afterwards because I didn't know whether I reflected what they felt correctly. And how did they respond to the stories? Uh, so far, everybody loved it, loved it, but they, it, there was one, a one story, a very interesting story, which is told on behalf of a dog. And mm. uh, when, I, when I sent, yes, when I sent the story to the family, they didn't reply for three days. And then a mother uh, who told me the story with the dog said, you know, Anna, we're afraid to read it. What if, if it doesn't match? Because they, it was already in the published book. She refused to read it before. And then on day four, she sent me a video and she said, we're all crying because it was like reliving it all again. It was very much like watching a film. And thank you very much for doing it. That's wonderful to hear. I wanted to ask how you came to meet the people behind the stories. Um, many people are my relatives. And my friends, there is a story there which is extremely personal, is about my mum. There are stories of people whom I sheltered. There is a story of whom I, who lived in my flat and I watched them, you know, and listened to their stories. Um, there, is, there is a story uh, of, of, of a dog uh, because, and we discover, I discovered these people because my dog died and I wanted to support Ukrainian dogs of the same pedigree. So that's how I found them. And so every single story has a very interesting background behind it. And one story or two stories are actually quite personal for me because a story of a girl who uh, gave me a lollipop I don't want to give you the spoilers it was a story on the Romanian border where I worked supporting the families that were going through crossing from the bomb areas. I found that story particularly moving thank you Anna. I think you could tell us just a little bit more about the experience of what you saw that you've captured in that story. Yeah, I, I don't think we've got the photograph, but I think it is in the yeah, in the. It's not a very good quality photograph, but because I took it, I'm not a good photographer. But it's a story about um, and the photographers of the bridge with toys, and uh, it's a, a pedestrian bridge, a border bridge between Ukraine and Romania. And when I came to the bridge from the Romanian side, I was quite surprised that the whole. Uh, bridge was littered with toys and sort of on the side, not littered, that's the wrong word, very tidily lined on the side. And I asked the border guard, I said, why the toys, why have you got the toys there? And he said, because the children are so scared when they see the foreign uniforms, they think they'll be shot and they're afraid to cross. So what we are doing, we basically decided that uh, we will give the toys to the children so that they are distracted and are persuaded to cross. And they were, when they were crossing, it was very interesting because um, I saw they're shattered, they need water, they need to eat, they need to sit down somewhere, but all they needed to do, both children and mothers, they had a lot of pent up emotion. They were just wanted to be hugged, they cried on my shoulder and it was quite an emotional thing. And this girl, what was amazing that we started, there was one girl and we started talking through the toys and um, she opened up to me. And if you read the story, you will read what she, we talked about. But what was the most extraordinary thing that at the end of our conversation, when I turned to go back to the bridge, she ran after me and gave me a lollipop. And I said, no, no, no. And she said, she said, look, I want you to have it. She was about eight. And if you think that that was probably the only sweet she had from the bombed town, from a little rucksack, that lollipop will stay with me forever. 
it shows how much being listened to can mean to somebody as well absolutely um and that's what what this what this book shows so beautifully is how well you've listened to the stories brought them out showing all these different characters all real people but every voice is very different and every experience is entirely different i felt that um throughout the stories we discover there's little things that make a big impact like that teddy bear like that lollipop so objects that are almost like talismans or small acts of understanding or help that sort of change someone's experience i love that um one of the quotes for the book was from Alec Russell, foreign editor of the Financial Times, who said, these stories are beautifully written, which they are, and give us a stunning and poignant sense of the state of play. Um, and I felt that these little, these little tokens, these objects are all vessels, either for remembering better days or perhaps for hoping for a return. How did you feel about drawing in objects and talismans as part of the stories? Well, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to write a book when, when I started thinking about it around the war in 20 objects, not just in 20 stories. So mm -hmm. I really took uh, all these little things, you know, well, not little, some of them will be, you know, there'll be a rifle, there'll be a painting, but the objects. But then I realized that the stories are bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So the, the objects are definitely there but also the emotion, the courage, you know, the resilience, and a lot of laughter. Laughter at the most absurd situation. And lots of people are telling me we are laughing where we shouldn't. You know, you're laughing, reading these stories and thinking, why are we laughing? This is such a dark situation. But that some of them are absolutely absurd. So there you go. That's absolutely true. And you're right, because I could only really read two or three stories at a time because they made me cry. Yeah. But they also made me laugh. And it's that as you say, the dark humour. I mean, where did, where did the subtitle come from? Was it was it obvious that that was what it had to be? Yes, yes. For me, it was obvious because uh, I thought that uh, all the stories about hope, humanity, and, of course, humour. But it was quite interesting that I had I received a, an email from France where uh, a man wrote to me saying, you weren't probably, you were not expecting this outcome, but after reading your book, I feel strangely optimistic. And I said, well, actually... I expected this because I wanted people to realize how strong, resilient, and how much hope is with Ukrainians. I think that really comes through. What, one of the what questions, uh, what objects that you did feature in the stories is actually a book. Yes. Tell me a little about that one. Well, uh, that was a very difficult story because it's a story, and I'll have to come to tell you a little bit about it. It's a story about the children's library in, in the occupied town of Kherson. And uh, there were several such certain books that the librarians had to hide because if the occupiers would have found these, these books, they would have been burned. And there was one particular book which was talking about the Ukrainian soldiers who already were killed and uh, the concern in, in 2014 and the concern was that the occupiers will see this book and go after the families and the families will be taken into the camps and things like that. So the whole story is the story of how this book was hidden, how this book was preserved by the librarians, but the whole story was told from the eyes of the book. So that when I talked about shivers down the spine, it was the spine of the book and also shivers down the spine. And also, uh, you know, I think it was quite um, uh, surreal because that's why I chose to tell the story on behalf of the book and not on behalf of the librarian who told me the story because the whole situation was surreal. How she was hiding it, where, how they were laughing when they were hiding this under lots of layers and why. And so, you know, it's 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 a surreal situation. That's why I thought that tell the story from the book would be better. I, I think it works beautifully. So, yes, it's the sort of capture the idea of living knowledge as well, isn't it? Yes. And what is contained within a book and why it's so important to store it and to share it and to keep and to keep that that going. Um You've mentioned the, the sixth sense, reminding us that you know humans aren't the only creatures who've been affected by the war, but what they what they can do. Um, I did find one particular story incredibly affecting, which was um, "Men Don't Cry," yes. which was something that I feel people should should read for themselves. Please do you know go go follow the links that David's posting in the chat and and, and get the book for yourself. Um, can you tell us just a little introduction to that without spoiling? 
Yes, it's an extraordinary book because, uh, extraordinary story because all the other stories were shared with me. Mm. This is a story which uh, was uh, filmed on the, on the phone of a soldier. And then he shared it on social media. So that was the only story which wasn't mine or shared with me directly. But it's an, an incredibly powerful story. It's such an incredible story to, to watch and then to write about that, you know, I really wanted it to be a part of, this, of the book. And it's, um, I can tell you more about it if, if you like. Yes, please. But, but it's a story about a, a man who comes, uh, or a soldier, a hero soldier who comes uh, to check in the village, whether the village is all clear, he's, he's marching through, the village is liberated, and he finds this old woman and he describes her the shriveled old apple you know by standing by the apple tree and he sees that she is she looks past him and asks him who, and asks who is that and he realizes that she's blind and she he sees that she's been wounded you know by glass that she needs uh, a lot of care and he said to her look I'll bring you you know take I'll radio somebody and they'll take you to the hospital and then he takes him to the kitchen because she's thirsty and she says to him, please close the door because I feel very drafty and I can't go to the end of the corridor where my son's room is. And it's very drafty. And he goes to the corridor and realizes that half of the house has been blown up and she doesn't know this. And she doesn't see this because she's blind. And he takes her to hospital and films as he comes out. Uh, of this house because she asks him have you closed the door and he doesn't have the courage to tell her and says yes I have and just wipes the tears and says she is the same age as my grandmother who lives in a lovely uh, house in the mountains in western Ukraine and and I think it was very powerful and it was called men don't cry because men don't do they um I think it would be really lovely to have a a taste of the stories that you've um, that you've written, and um, I know that Dave is going to read for us an extract from the very first story in the collection, which is called the Harp. Yeah. Come on. The Harp, twenty fourth of February, twenty twenty two, Kiev. A call at four a.m. is never good news. He only left last night for the conference in Lviv. We have the tickets for the ski train tomorrow to join him there for a family weekend. Why the hell? He starts the call with, I don't want to be intrusive. What a strange word, I think, off asleep. Intrusive. Is it because he's intruding into my sleep? I'm sorry to disturb you, he carries on, but the war has started. You need to get the children out as soon as possible. The car keys are in the hall by the mirror. My husband is strangely polite and calm, pausing after every word, giving it time to sink in. I haven't driven for 10 years since the accident, is the only thing I find to say. His calmness is now steaming. You'll have to start hacking. I switch on the news. The TV is not working. Our new windows are soundproof. I only hear the explosions and the sirens when they peek out. My first impulse is to go back to sleep and wake up a couple of hours later from the worst nightmare I've ever had. To do what I teach our youngest to do when he's crying at night. Wave a bad dream away, then turn on your side, put your hands under your cheek and smile to invite some happy dreams in. And that's what I try to do for the next 10 minutes. I lie on my side, Eyes closed, but my heart is racing, my mind is racing, until I have a clear plan. One, find the car keys and check the car will start. I can drive it, it's an automatic, I'll remember the rest once we get going. I keep repeating this mantra. Two, pack the bags with documents and children's warm clothes. Three, wake them up, try to get them dressed quickly, always a challenge. Four, take the road west to my husband. He'll protect us. It's not just our car that's on auto drive. I am too. There's a lot to pack for four children, not forgetting their favourite toys and snacks. It's a six-hour journey after all. An hour later, I wake them up 
one by one, make sure they brush their teeth, which is important in any circumstances, and fill them with hot chocolate. Much better than stopping on the way when one of them is covered in spills, or all four of them, actually. By the time I exchange frantic texts and calls with friends and relatives and load the car, it's well into midday. I bundle the children into our four-wheel drive, check we have everything we need, including the guitar and the violin they need to practice, and go up to the flat for the last time. Bye-bye, piano, I say, running my fingers over the glossy black lid. We'll come back soon, you'll see. Though how can I promise? Will we ever come back? She's standing by the window, patiently waiting for me to collect her. Every string tight with nerves, the wavy V of her wooden frame like hands raised in prayer. Even the silver plate with the maker's brand name, Salvi, is begging me. I was told Salvi means same in Italian. I can't leave her. I just can't leave her heart. I carry her out of the flat, into the lift, down to the car. She it's neatly over my children's heads. The case looks just like a second week. I start the car, set up a GPS. Mirror, signal, maneuver. I'm taking the hardest driving test of my life, moving my children to safety. Why does the GPS show 18 hours instead of six, I wonder? The road out of town is not as packed as I thought it would be. And when we get to the motorway, it's empty. Maybe everyone is still in shock. My husband calls just as two-year-old Luca knocks on the window and shouts, Mummy, look. Veliki Kulbabki, giant dandelions. He's proud of the sweet word he remembers, Kulbabki. I look up to the right and see dozens of parachutes, a couple of fields away, floating in the sky. Don't take the motorway via hostel mill, my husband is saying. This is where the Russian assault is going on. Choose another route. Ah, that explains the parachutes and why the road is empty. I turn sharp left across the fields, praying that the GPS will pick up another road and that none of the kids decides to throw up now. The harp rattles and jangles on every bump over their heads, repeating, Salvi, Salvi, save them, move away from danger. I've never been so happy to be in three thick lines of traffic moving very slowly. It means that we finally joined the right road. I've even discovered how to switch off the wipers and switch on the fog lights, thanks to fellow travellers calling out from the Four hours and 70 kilometres later, it becomes clear that we won't make it to Lviv tonight. We need to find a place to stay. But then many people around me will be doing it as well. The traffic slows down again. I break sharply, and the edge of the heart case pushes my head forward. Think. Of course. If we turn off the motorway in a couple of hours, we'll be close to a familiar village and a hundred kilometres safer. We need to, to turn, I decide. That's the sign. The harp has given us her blessing. Thank you, Dave. And Anna, we're showing a picture of the harp. And, that's the harp. and of course, the story carries on and it has a different ending. But the key thing at the end is that uh, when uh, Victoria, whom you've seen the picture, it's the true story, it's her story and her children's story. Uh, uh, when she said that, I know that there are some harps which can definitely save your life. And mine is one of them. Thank you. That is a really vivid and, and graphic image left of what it was like to flee that night yeah. and I think one thing that strikes is the combination of the mundane with the extraordinary have the children had hot chocolate when should I give it to them has everybody brushed their teeth and that that need to kind of carry on with normality at the same time as doing something almost unimaginable yeah and that's that's most of the stories have this you will read about some very everyday things and you know i really wanted people to relate because many of us will do knitting will do jam making jams etc but 
that mix is mixed with hiding the rifle behind the jams. It, it's mixed with knitting for somebody to give her warmth when she's scared of explosions. So everything has this mundane or ordinary stuff mixed with things which are unimaginable. And one of the things that's, that's we talked, the, the, the story from the harp is about, is about leaving, is about getting out. And of course, as well as the stories from the ground in Ukraine, you do feature quite a few from the Ukrainian diaspora who are finding ways to help from abroad and, and suffering separation and loss in a different way. Can you tell us something about how this sort of wide disparate group has come together to support those communities back home? Uh, it's extraordinary because, uh, you know, the diaspora is from all, first of all, Ukrainian diaspora is one of the largest diasporas in the world when mm -hmm. we talk about cultural diasporas and a big, a big community in Latin America and Brazil and Argentina even. And if you ever drink, you know, Roboy tea and, and much, uh, yerba mate tea, that's all produced by Ukrainians in Patagonia who would have thought that, you know, but but it's from there all the way to Canada, America, Poland, you know, Britain. Uh, suddenly, everybody came together, and it was extraordinary how people self-organized to help. And you could call, I would, you know, call somebody in California in the middle of the night, and they would say, oh, I'm, and she would say, I'm breastfeeding, but I'm at the same time fighting the trolls. There, there will be somebody, you know, who will suddenly say, look, we need to pick up cars, to drive some medical supplies. And suddenly people who don't have never met self-organized and are driving together. So I think that that part, nobody expected it to be such a strong wave and movement of support. And one of the stories you, you talk about these people as the invisible army. Yes. Was that your phrase or is that something that's being used? No, no it's my phrase, which is now used everywhere. <laughs> It's yeah, so it's that is quite funny because I just imagined that we are all invisible army because we are helping and, and everything. And I had even threats from Russia saying Russia sending, you know, comments saying, We'll show you what your invisible army, we'll find you, you'll become visible. But but it's a massive army. It's an invisible army. It's now used quite a lot about the diaspora. Yeah. And a couple of the stories, particularly one of them really spoke to me was was painting by numbers. Because yeah. it shows the the difficulty, the resilience and the the sadness of, of younger people affected by the war. Could you show the picture, Flora? Oh, yeah. I could talk about this. Um, this is a story of a young uh, Ukrainian equestrian champion. And this girl um, was um, supported or she came to Brussels and was staying with my friends. And she had a lot of trauma because her horse was let out in Butcher. Uh, in out of the stables to avoid being burned alive if there is a missile or Russians are killing the horses because they killed a lot, killed a lot of animals just for the fun of it. And and um, she still hopes to find the horse. She's never found the horse. Um, and uh, uh, the most extraordinary thing was that I tried, because she was so traumatized, I tried to um, uh, give her something positive, and I brought her a painting, a painting by numbers, which was the Thames, a very young, so a nice couple wandering down the Thames, the lights, you know, the river on the side, so very, very placid, romantic, cheesy picture. And, um, and she said, can I please, <coughs> excuse me, can I please choose my own num my own colors? I said, of course, of course. And then she gave me the painting. And I took a deep breath because if you look at the painting now, and I hope Flora will show it to you, you will see that it is not about the Thames. It's not about the couple holding hands because she painted the wall. Yeah. And the colors that she has chosen. I mean, that's an incredibly vivid yeah, because representation of what she's thinking and feeling. Because she was going to say she, she all the black and all the red and also the blue she chose as the color of hope and of course black figures in the middle and I sent the photograph for her father and he said to her father and he said straight away you realize she painted the wall she painted her feelings she hasn't painted the lights and a stroll down the Thames and I have this picture treasure I'll always treasure it I think it says something very very powerful yeah thank you. Um, I mean, I feel that in addition to the, the diaspora, one of the other really unique things that's happened is reflected in this book is this collaborative effort. And 
this collaborative effort was what happened to make the book come come to life as well. Um, it's an, a, a real process of 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 of, of the design, the printing and so on. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, it was extraordinary. I, I felt that somebody up there was helping me with this because when the war started, I was contacted by a friend of mine who um, is a well-known literary agent and she read my article in the Times, uh, which is one of the stories in the book now. And she said, why don't you write more stories? You know, like 40 stories. But I thought, yes, but it's I haven't got time. And also it will be wrong to make money even for the publisher to on these stories it has to be something which will go back uh, and i was involved in a wonderful project of uh, with di redmond who is this famous writer of you know children's film books and bbc series everybody grew up with bob the builder you know sam the fireman sam you know etc postman but and she said i want to write something for ukrainian about ukrainian children I said no why don't we do the book for Ukrainian children, which will be the trauma healing book? And she teamed up with the Children of War UK, uh, which is an amazing charity for children affected by war. And the book is now, the project is, is now working in eight countries and it's been a massive success. But, but crucially, when I went to Kiev in August, I went to see the new printers in Ukraine who took over printing the book. And I thanked them and I said, look, you know, your big printing works, national printing works, thank you for this. And is there anything you need from me? You know, we're handing over all the plates and everything, not the plates, but PDFs, etc. And he said, what are you doing now? I said, well, well, you know, I have the stories. I was offered to write, I was asked to write the biography of Zelensky. And I said, there'll be eight biographies in three months. I'm not going to do that. But um, these stories are, are really real story, real life stories. And he said, would you like to do it with us? And we can print for free. And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. And I sort of forgot about it. And then three months before the second very dark anniversary of the war, uh, he called me again and said, we are ready. Are you? And I <laughs> are said, your stories? <laughs> I said, okay. And, and so the designer, she was uh, from Kharkiv, and while she was designing the cover, which is behind Flora, she uh, had windows from her uh, house blown out. And that's why, you know, the houses, you will see some of the windows are blown out. But okay. also, if you look at the cover, you will see that uh, you will see two images. And if you will probably see the houses, but all the Ukrainians see the missiles first. And that's the whole sort of reality of the war, that you live and the, the windows are lit, but there is also the, the, the missiles thing. And what was amazing that everybody in the team worked for free. The printers, the, the, the way it was delivered, nobody took money for petrol, for anything, you know, the editor, the, the, the you know, the public, the designer, me, we all worked for free. But the most extraordinary thing happened when the book was printed and published and delivered here and it should, and, and was given to everybody, you know, from the volunteers to Her Majesty. And we received really nice letters from, you know, from the palace as well. But the most extraordinary thing about this book was um, how the people reacted, their whole stories, they, 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 was a big, about their stories. I said, look, we'll sell the books and we will give you, all of you, pro rata, we'll share the money with you. And then the, the extraordinary thing started because one person said, oh, fantastic, we will. We need it for the, the mining equipment for the farmers. Another one said, fantastic, we are supporting the dog shelter. The third said, we need the operation equipment for the children's hospital in Lviv. So every single person, every single character in the book chose somebody else they wanted to help. And we now, the book was out on the 29th of um, February, and we have completed most of the projects. We've only got two projects to complete. That is extraordinary. I have some pictures from the characters and people from the books with the projects that they completed, yes. which I'd love to share, and you can just tell yes. us a little bit about each of them. Yes, I will.
Okay, this is the library. These are the people who were hiding the books in the library. And what we've done for them, we've bought the equipment which the Russian occupiers stole from the library. They stole the uh, interactive board, they stole the computer. But you know, this is the reality of war is such that we've bought them everything. It's in the warehouse in Kherson, and they can't go and get it because this the, that area of the city is so heavily shelled now that they can't literally drive and collect it, but they will collect next week, I hope. And so the library's open again. Yes, the library is open and becomes it became the heart, the heart and the hub, and they work with traumatized teenagers. They're everything from poetry evenings to uh, children's trauma sessions. That is wonderful to hear. This is an interesting one because that's the character of the book called Rogo, who is that when one story is told through the eyes of the dog, and Natalia was his in translator. She translated it into human, and they took it to uh, uh, the shelter with uh, 17 dogs and seven cats, and we got enough food for six months for that shelter. Okay, so that, that is a lovely one because that uh, uh, wonderful, smiling blonde woman is a very well-known pianist and the head of the Cultural Association of Ukrainians in the UK, Ala Sirenko, and her story was extraordinary. It's very funny. It's I think it's one of the funniest stories in the book where uh, she, after the concerts, charity, one of the charity concerts in Ukraine, was uh, literally ambushed by a Japanese woman who came to the concert. And this woman tried to shove the keys from Toyota, her Toyota, into her hands and said, this is for Ukraine. And Allah was so lost, said, no, 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 I can't do this. I can't take the, the car. And anyway, you will read what happened later. But they ended up eating Ukrainian borscht with chopsticks. And it's quite a funny story, but also a very moving story. And uh, the second photograph is already in Lviv, in Western Ukraine, and we collected enough money to buy the equipments for the operations which they requested. We're going to look at just a couple more photographs, but then I'm going to um, see whether the audience have questions for you. So okay. anyone who would like to put some questions in the chat, please start thinking about them now. Okay. Yes, this is the demining equipment. That is the first story of the half. You've seen Victoria, the girl who drove with the half across the fields, and she asked to donate the money to give uh, to the special designed equipment for the, which is the tractor, which also is protected from the mines and is seeking the mines. And uh, we collected quite a lot of money through a charity dinner, and it goes straight there next week. So basically, we've got, I think we've got two, two projects which were nearly finished, but what was good about these projects, they were all very specific, they were very practical and very tangible, so they were not, let's just give the money to somebody, but I think you've got a very dark photograph, and I wanted to say, yes, this one, and I wanted to say what the money for this session goes to. Um, the live the, the were printing in Kharkov with Kharkiv, which printed my book. Uh, they were printing literally under shelling because uh, they had 95 windows out, all the glass and everything while they were printing the book, but they were still carrying on to deliver the book to you to the UK in time. But this is the type uh, printing works next to them called the Factor, and there. 50,000 books were destroyed by uh, the Russians in one blow. This is, this is the photograph of these books, mainly because they were the manuals, the textbooks for Ukrainian children, and they wanted to destroy the Ukrainian identity and the Ukrainian future, which is horrific, of course, but it's very cynical. But also uh, six people died, 23 people were wounded. So. The money uh, from today and from the donations today will go to the people in that particular area in those printing works. And we are thinking of something really specific. That's a wonderful cause to be contributing to. And thank you so much for sharing thank that. You. Really, yeah, so many difficult photos to see. Um, and Anna, I mean, I, I, I'd like to um, find out what the if the audience have questions for us, but just before we do that, I just want to say 
an enormous thank you for coming and, and, and sharing everything with us because this has been uh, obviously a book that is um, a sort of a, a passionate project that has so much importance to it and has meant so much to you to bring. So it must be quite hard and emotional to talk about it. And I really appreciate that you've joined us to do so. Thank, so you. thank you very much for that. Thank you. I'm reliving it all as, as I talk through, of course, yeah. because I, I hear the voices of those people, the gestures, the way they were telling me everything. So, yeah, it's reliving the whole story. And I, we do have some questions coming in. Um, the first one is from Helen. Are there any stories that you've heard since publishing that you wish had been in the book? Yes, yes, I'm collecting. Yes, there are lots of stories, uh, you know, and I'm collecting them. And, uh, you know, one story I can tell you about it sort of in generic terms about Romeo and Juliet, where people were driving from on the 24th, you know, from um, uh, quite middle-aged, you know, people to the West, uh, Western Ukraine, and realized that they've never been married. So they stopped in a church somewhere on the road, found another uh, sort of uh, driving family who stopped also on the road and decided that this is their Romeo and Juliet moment. So these are quite an, quite extraordinary, you know, little snippets of everyday life, which are, yes, yes, I, I am collecting them. So I think we'll be doing the 40 stories one day. Good. I think I think there are more stories that are going to deserve to be told. I mean, if anybody would like to put on their, their 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 camera and say and say hello and ask a question, you're very very welcome as well. It doesn't only have to come through the chat. And indeed, I can see Dave. I believe you have a question. I do. Uh, I wanted to talk to you. I mean, you just made the point Anna, that it's the mundane and every day that really registers with people uh, as as a short story writer myself and you are both a writer and a journalist how important was it to you to include those those everyday moments so that the the stories really connect with the audience i, I was going to say they several of them remind me of a very powerful photograph that i remember seeing as a small child i lived near the imperial war museum and my grandfather used to take me there frequently and at one point there was an exhibition of photos from in this country, we had uh, the Ministry for Information during the Second World War, encouraging people to grow their own vegetables and cook. And there was a photo that they explained that they didn't use at the time because they thought it was too shocking, uh, which was a woman stood at a, a cooker in a flat in the east end of London. And it's one of those blocks of flats round a courtyard. And the courtyard is behind her. And you can see her kitchen window has been blown out and there isn't a single window left left intact in any of the other buildings. And she stood there with a gas mask on, cooking supper for everybody. And it's a really, really powerful image. Not just because of the gas mask and the damage, but because she's a woman still cooking supper. Yeah. Uh, you see, that for me was, uh, it was very important. And I, uh, funnily enough, I got the quote of um, Margaret Kennedy, who was this wonderful writer during the Second World War, who was recording her in her diary their everyday stuff. And she, had, she mentioned in her books, I wonder what people thought when they were waiting for the news for, or from Waterloo. What did they laugh about? What uh, thoughts were they in their heads? And I started thinking about that in the same way. What, I mean, you can't, you can only read that much of the news, but you still have to read a, a, a story, bedtime story to a child. You still have to uh, maybe uh, cook dinner. You have to make sure that, you know, everything is washed uh, for tomorrow. And there are lots of humorous memes now all over Ukraine because there is no electricity. You know, how people iron, but they iron with the hot pan with pan of water and they are iron clothes putting the pan of water on the clothes and that is the iron so you know lots of things like that but i think it's it's um yeah it's really uh it, the mundane i think is very relatable and i had the a very interesting comments from lots of american uh, readers who would put things like oh these stories are universal despite the war so for them they were relatable first and then it was about the war but i still was very grateful that they were reading them and they were absorbing what was happening in ukraine you, you told us earlier about 
your experience during the power cut um, and the best breakfast you ever had. I'd love to hear that little story again. Yes, yes it was very, I mean, several things actually, well, several experiences. One was we went to the theatre with my mom, and uh, they announced in the theatre that um, we might have the missile attack. So if there is a missile attack, uh, we have got, we all have to go down to the shelter and we have got three choices. One, we will come back and continue the play afterwards. Two, we can come back tomorrow night and continue the play. And three, if you don't want to bother and come back again, we will tell you the end of the play. <laughs> So there was, you know, some humor there as well. Then we played Russian roulette with my mom, quite literally, because the electricity would switch off suddenly. And she's 80 and her flat is on the fifth floor. So what we agreed with her that we should do is that I would stand downstairs and she will get into the lift and we will hope that the electricity will still be there when she reaches the fifth floor. And, and she said, that's our Russian roulette, quite literally. And for me, the most extraordinary, talking about the power cut, I had a situation once, uh, which for me is probably the best breakfast, the warmest breakfast I've ever had, was when the electricity was from three in the morning to five in the morning, and I was madly working, doing typing the emails. And of course, just as I was about to send them, the power cut, the Wi-Fi call, you know, done, gone. And I realized that I have to go to the 24-hour Catherine Warner, hoping that maybe um, they have the generator and I can end the Wi-Fi. So I ran into the cafe, five in the morning, still dark, and uh, the guy at the, the counter says to me, you know what, we still haven't started the generator, it starts at six, but I managed to bake in these two hours to bake the croissants in the electric oven. You're the first customer to try, would you like one? And that for me was the best croissant I've ever had. Again, you are such a storyteller, Anna. Um, there is so, there's so much that comes out that just of humanity and of humor and just you bring things to life very vividly. And we've had some lovely, lovely comments in the chat that I just want to share with you. Um, listening to your stories, hearts touch, tears are appearing. Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you for your work, dedication and loyalty. And your book is sensational, which I agree with. It touches the heart, makes eyes cry, pushes the brain to think. Thank you. We're with you in Ukraine. And that's from Tatiana. Thank and you. I think that is a sort of response that I feel you've been having across the board with this book. Um, it's, it's very interesting uh, what sort of response I get, because uh, people choose a different story as their favorite story. And it's very interesting why they choose this story. There was there's somebody who worked in Korea and suddenly he said, the story about abortion, a Japanese woman is the best. Then somebody, uh, then another girl, a German girl, a, a Ukrainian girl in Germany emailed me yesterday saying, I really like the way uh, that you talk about the, the, how women still get groomed and looked after themselves, even in the darkest time in the shelling. And because she she, I know her, she's a very groomed young girl. So everybody chose something which I have, uh, or there was a children's psychiatrist who said, very well known, who said, I really like the story of the of the dog because I'm in, I had enough of people and the dog really resonates with me. So everybody chooses. So that response was quite surprising for me that everybody chooses a different story. And you had an unexpected response from America? Yeah, they, in America, there were very interesting responses because um, they they would say, not just them, actually, lots of people said that to me as well, but they, several people wrote to me and said, we can't read the whole book. We have to read one or two stories and then pause. And in America, it was very interesting that they talked about emotions. The response was about, oh, we love this story because it's about love. So it's about quite simple everyday things, but more that they couldn't cope with reading the whole stories, the whole book in one go. It's extraordinary. We have one new message. Um, and we have this is time for the last question. You mentioned small moments of hope. While collecting these stories, was there a particular moment that made you feel hopeful? Um, there were quite a few, but I think for me, the most extraordinary moment was this girl with a lollipop. Because it was not just the most extraordinary emotional moment, it was uh, the Ukrainian spirit and readiness to give your last thing to somebody else. 
And I knew that if this little girl is doing it, then everybody else will be doing this. Definitely. Definitely. Well, I'd like to remind everyone that in order to find purchase a copy of the book for yourself, the website is around the war in 20 stories. Dot com and that's all going to be available on our website as well and as Anna said all proceeds from the first printing the book going to charitable projects in Ukraine and we know exactly where this evening's is going to go and I think that's a wonderful thing and of course you can make donations at Just Giving as well if you'd like to give further support and um, again that details all in the chat. Um, Anna we're going to leave in, in a moment because we've, we've filled up our hour which has gone in a flash that has been a wonderful conversation thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. the stories and for sharing them with everybody who's joined us tonight um, I want to say an enormous thank you on behalf of Milton Keynes Literary Festival um, for coming to coming to join us and we would love to have you back with the next 20 stories um, <laughs> well I mean it's a very difficult one isn't it because one would hope we do not need any more stories but if that is the case, and it has to be, we would love you to come back and share them with us um, at some point in the future. So there, is, there is this photograph at the end, which I think sums up this whole thing for me. Well, from the cafe, do you remember, Flora? I'm about to share exactly that photo, because yeah. I feel it's a wonderful way to end the evening. Um, if people would like to unmute and give Anna a, a round of applause, I think that would be hugely justified, because I think it's a huge amount of affection coming towards her for everything that she's done um, and the stories that she's shared. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much for supporting Ukraine and for joining in. And I will, of course, report when we send the money and you will see the photographs, the receipts, everything is, we are not taking any money at all. That would be absolutely wonderful. Here is the final photograph that yes, I'm, this is the photograph is what we're all hoping for. Yes, this is the photograph which, when you say about small moments of hope, that's a cafe. You know, I've taken this picture three weeks ago in Kiev. And you can, of course, think of all we need is love. And you instantly think of the of the song. But here they played on this famous melody, <laughs> famous of the song, with famous kind of, kind of victory. <laughs> And on that note, Anna, I'm going to say final thank you so much. And thank you very much to the audience who's come to join us for this evening. And we look forward to seeing you all again at Milton Milton Keynes Lit Fest very soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.